in my last video I briefly mentioned the first aid kit that I take with me up into the hills. I said during that video that if anybody wanted me to go into more detail and break it down a little more that they should let me know in the comments below. Well people did that so here we are. A couple of years ago I recorded a video that looked at my bushcraft first aid kit, the sort of kit that I would take out with me into the woods when I'm bushcrafting. And whilst it's certainly true that there are some similarities in the equipment between my hill first aid kit and my bushcraft first aid kit, there are also some differences in equipment. But to be perfectly honest, that's not really the important thing. The differences aren't that important. What I really want you to take away from this video is the thought process that I've gone through and my logic that I hope I've arrived at that leads me to not wanting to have exactly the same first, kid, first aid kit when I'm in the woods as when I'm in the hills and vice versa. So whilst we are definitely going to look at the contents of my hill first aid kit, I promise you, I do want to spend just a little bit of time explaining the logic and thought process that I've gone through to arrive at the kit that I'm carrying today. Let me talk briefly about this logic then. Firstly, I only carry stuff in my first aid kit that I am trained and comfortable in using. I don't carry anything that I don't know how to use. I don't carry anything that if I were to use inadvertently or use the wrong way is likely to, to you know, incur further damage to the casualty. So that really reduces things quite a lot. That eliminates all the crap you see people carrying on YouTube. Suture kits and chest drains and giving sets and airways and God only knows what else. Gets rid of all that, keeps things nice and simple. So I only carry what I'm comfortable and trained to use. Secondly, I carry first aid kit relevant to the activity that I'm undertaking but I also apply a good old fashioned huge dollop of common sense. Yes, there's all sorts of injuries and ailments that people could sustain whilst out in the hills and out in the mountains, you know, all sorts. But what's the likelihood of A, them happening, and B, me being the person that's present when they do? Statistically, most people out in the hills, I'm imagining, suffer from sprains, strains, blisters, dehydration, nicks and cuts, that type of thing. The sort of thing that a really basic first aid kit can deal with. Every now and then someone will fracture both their femurs and their spine. But let's leave that. Let's leave that to the big girls and boys to come and sort out. You know, let's not try and carry kit to cater for that because the chances of that happening and us being there, incredibly small. So I apply those two pieces of logic to my first aid kit. Am I comfortable in using it? And am I likely, genuinely likely, to encounter, you know, what sort of in, what sort of injuries and ailments am I genuinely likely to encounter? Let's cater for that. More recently as well, there's been a third aspect that's influenced my choice around what I carry in my first aid kit. It's a book I picked up a couple of months ago called Outdoor First Aid by Catherine Wills. And in that book, fantastic book, you've got to get it. Catherine talks about what should go into a first aid kit. And she readily accepts there's no right answer. There's no right answer. There's no perfect first aid kit. So what she's done, which is quite clever, is she interviewed 200 outdoors people. Some of them outdoors professionals, some of them like me, you know, enthusiastic amateurs and everything else in between. She interviewed them and she analysed bit by bit the content of their first aid kits. Any piece of kit that was in 10% or more of those 200 people's equipment made it onto this list. Now I'm not going to read out, you're going to be thankful to hear, all of the pieces of equipment. In fact, I'm also going to bring it up on screen. But working from the most commonly found across those 200 people, I'm going to work from the top down to 80%. This is what was in there. Examination gloves, 95%. Medical tape, 93%. Support bandage, i.e. crepe, 92%. Scissors, 91%. Plasters, 88%. Wound dressing, 87%. Medi wipes, 81%. Non or low adherent dressing, 80%. So I also apply that logic as well. Do I want to carry everything that came up on screen a few seconds ago? No. But what I was really chuffed with, what I was really you know, pleased with was 
I've only just picked this book up. When I looked at those top 20% of items, that's all stuff that I carry. So that's telling me that my thinking, my logic is aligned with these 200 people that she interviewed. And I imagine the vast majority of outdoors people as well. So there's that third piece of, of, of that data point there that I've added to my previous experience and also um, what I'm trained and, and, and experienced and comfortable in using. There's also that data that she did from that 200 people survey. Let's have a look in my first aid kit and see if you can sort of align what I'm carrying with what I mentioned um, just then in that, in that piece of research that Catherine did. Here's that first aid bag again. I've removed from here my personal hygiene kit that I, I place in here as well. And I've also removed from here my equipment care kit, my kit care kit as well. If you want to see that kit care kit and what I take to look after my gear and equipment when I'm out, let me know in the comments below and I'll do another video doing a breakdown of that. Now, I don't particularly pack this in a specific order, but there's always some things that I try and have at the very top of that bag for a logical reason. One is a pack of barrier gloves and the second is an aid memoir going through first aid treatment protocols. I find that putting the gloves on gives me some breathing space to calm things down and I've also got that so that if I have a complete brain fat and a complete brain fog I can work my way through that making sure that nothing is missed. I tend to keep those at the top. In no particular order I've got some cleansing wipes there to clean any wounds. Once I've cleaned wounds I could apply some low adherence or non low adherence dressing pads there they're probably about five they're five centimeters by five centimeters i carry a couple of those i carry four elastoplasts for sticking plasters they're the let me just hold them up they're that sort of size there sort of a finger dimension i carry four of those i carry two blister packs or two two blister dressings I carry some ibuprofen and paracetamol. I'll come back to these in just a second. I carry some tape, a second foil blanket. I carry a heavy duty, uh, more waterproof uh, bag at the top of my rucksack. I carry some Dextro energy tablets, some Nivea for chapped lips and, and anything else that needs lubricating and some bond jelly because I tend to find that when I personally get run down I get lots of ulcers on the tip of my tongue and on the inside of my lips and it's a, not debilitating but bloody hell it's annoying so I carry some bond jelly in order to treat those um, those oral problems I said I'd come back to the medical uh, to the medication here years ago I once had a tick can't remember where I was can't remember who I was with but what I do remember is that nobody had a tick remover. So one of the old sweats there took a pack of tablets, I don't know what they were, and carved into them a very, very small V in the hard plastic. And I found that ever since, that's a really simple tick remover. You're never going to forget it because it's built into your medication. I've also done it with the ibuprofen here. So the first thing I do is whenever I put any medication in my in a blister pack into my first aid kit, I just carve out all around the edges several V notches of different sizes to cater for different size ticks, I suppose. And I've always found on the rare occasions I've needed to remove a tick, which is very rarely, that's a brilliant way of doing it. Saves you having to carry an extra piece of kit as well. And if you ever forget to carve them in, then you can do so using a pair of scissors. Now, I mentioned a pair of scissors there. I carry scissors with me, but I don't class it as part of my first aid kit. I class it as part of my kit care kit because they're attached to a Swiss army knife. So overall, I am carrying a pair of scissors to cut up um, any, any tape, to cut up any dressings, things like that. There's just another part of my kit. I don't class it as part of my first aid kit. How simple is that? I've got some gloves. I've got some different types of dressings. I've got some tape that could use as a, to tape things on or to, to, to strap things up. I've got some medication. I've got some creams to deal with just annoying little niggling things that I don't want to progress any further. Because I'm outdoors walking distance, I'm carrying some blister um, dressings as well. 
and I'm carrying some, some plasters for the usual sort of nicks and cuts and scrapes. How simple is that? That's my hill first aid kit. I do carry a conforming bandage, um, a compression bandage, but bizarrely, it's not really mine. It's Willow's because I always take something out to treat hair as well. And I found that some of the best um, compression bandages, conforming bandages that I've ever seen have been ones for dogs. Uh, they're incredibly adhesive because dogs are obviously trying to pull them off and nibble them off. Really adhesive, they, they, they compress very, very well. So I carry one for hair as well, but I carry it in the back of my car. And apologies, bad admin, but I've left it in the car and haven't put it in this kit to come and do this video. So I'll put a picture up on the screen as to what that looks like, but I haven't got it to show on camera right now. But just how simple is that? This allows me to treat nicks, cuts, scrapes, abrasions, small cuts. It allows me to treat blisters. If somebody's got an area of friction and heat building up, I could use the Nivea on it or the blister or the blister tape. I've got some tape to stick things down or as a temporary dressing to hold something in place. I've got some medication um, to deal with the, you know, the typical headaches and bruises and aches and pains that I get at my creaky old age. That's it. You're not gonna find anything invasive in there. You're not gonna find chest drains and sutures and, and giving sets and airways and Christ knows what else, because as I've said, statistically, I'm not likely to encounter those types of injuries that need that. And even if I did, I'm not trained or qualified or, or confident anymore to use that sort of stuff on people. So I just don't carry it. What a simple, simple, first aid kit so my question to you is what do you carry in your first aid kits that if you were to be really critical about it and i want you to be critical you could get rid of because you don't really know how to use it or more likely you're carrying something for the 10 million in one chance that it might happen while you're out in the hills or the woods and that you happen to be the person that's there are you carrying stuff around just in case. And as, 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 as commendable and as admirable as that is, how many years or decades have you been carrying it round just in case? So in the comments below, let me know and be really critical about this. Be honest with yourself. What would you drop from your first aid kit? Having sort of reflected on what I carry in mind, but more importantly, more importantly, why I carry what I carry and why I don't carry everything else. Let me know in the comments below. I have referred earlier in this video to several um, other videos that I've made around first aid kits. I'm popping those up on screen now. If you've not seen them, or it's been a while since you've watched them, why not go and check those out and I'll see you out on the hills again very soon. Cheers.